Well, welcome to the First United Church of Christ for our fireside service on this Mother's Day 2023. It was kind of neat. Uh, a few days ago, I posted pictures of Kathleen's mother and, and mine, and uh, just to honor them on Mother's Day. And I was uh, just really pleased to see how many people uh, came back and said, boy, that we, you look like your folks. And uh, I think that's the highest compliment. We had uh, remarkable moms. Let's begin our call to worship. We are gathered to worship together the God who has called us to love God and the God who has asked us to follow God's direction. We are invited to worship God in the spirit of truth. We do so because we know the spirit and the spirit knows us. We are reminded that we are not alone. Because the Holy Spirit is among us, Jesus is with God, and God is present. We can rejoice because he lives, we live as well. Amen. It's a remarkable hymn, uh, Lord, Speak to Me That I May Seek. It's a hymn that I've sung probably for most of my uh, teenage and adult life. And it's still one, it's one that means uh, a great deal to me. It has a lot to say to us on, on this particular Sunday morning. Let's prepare to confess our sins together. We know that God is ever more ready to listen than we are to pray. So let us bring our whole selves to, to this time of prayer. Let's open our hearts to God in real open acknowledgement of our shortcomings. Father, you see us on our sin and yet you love us. And we are so very grateful. And even when we continue on and on and over and over again with the same, fa the same failings, your grace never runs out. We praise you for your faithfulness. We confess our inability to, to flee temptation apart from you. So keep our eyes ever set upon you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, continue to remind us of what is true and convict us of sin. And that becomes abundantly necessary. Turn our hearts back to you. We receive your forgiveness and believe that we are righteous in your sight. Thank you, Father. Amen. My dear friends, please know that God hears our prayers, the prayers that we say together, the prayers that are lifted up in this moment of time, in a place of safety and love. Each day offers a, a chance to, to begin again. We know that God loves us. He loves us through and through. In the, same of, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And we can sing thanks be to God, amen, and indeed sing glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. For as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. We turn to the scriptures and we read some scriptures that are familiar and some that are not very familiar to us. We pray that God would, uh, His Spirit might rest upon us, that He might help us to be steadfast in our hearing, steadfast in our speaking, in our believing, and perhaps most importantly, in our living. Amen. The pericope for uh, this Sunday morning is Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20, and indeed we don't often read from this Psalm of David. But he leaves us with these words. Praise our God, all peoples, that the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, has tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads, and we went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and, and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear, all of you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely has listened, and he has heard my prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or, or withheld his love from me. We read from the, the book of Acts, 
the Acts of the Apostles from the 17th chapter. And uh, we continue to, to follow the preachings of Paul, particularly as he speaks to the Greeks. Luke leaves these words with us. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And that is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands if he needed anything. Rather, he gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the men he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And then we read from the 14th chapter of John, and we... Here's some of the last words that, that Jesus shares with his disciples. If you love me, keep my commands. Now ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. When that day you will realize that, that I am in my Father, and you are me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading and to our understanding of his word. I guess you could say, welcome to another list of uh, things a mother never would say. Listen to a couple of these things and see if you could ever, ever picture your mom saying these, because I sure couldn't picture my mom saying these things. How on earth can you see the TV sitting so far back? Get up much, much closer. Anybody have their mom say that? Here's a good one. Yeah, I used to skip school a lot, too. Hey, honey, just leave the lights on. Leave all the lights on. It makes the house look so much more cheery. Hey, let, let me smell that shirt. Yeah, I, I think it's good enough for another week. Go ahead. Go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed him and walk him every day. Well, if, Timmy mom's, if Timmy's mom says it's okay... That's good enough for me. Hey, look, the curfew is just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. I'm trying to picture my mother saying this one. I don't have a tissue with me, so just go ahead and, and, and use your sleeve. Or, hey, look, don't bother about wearing a jacket. The, the windshield's bound to get warmer during the day. Well, you know, somebody has to make sure that we all survive childhood, don't they? And in most cases, that, that, that falls to moms. And I really can't imagine a better scripture for us to read on Mother's Day than this one. Just listen how it begins. If anyone loves me, he will obey. Now, that's what Christ says to us in our text for the day. Jesus is, is talking to his disciples. He, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. 
My Father will love him, and we will come to him and, and make our home with him. Jesus is telling us that, that obedience is, is, is a pretty important thing. He says it's remarkably important to our spiritual lives. And I think most of us have figured out that obedience is really a pretty good, pretty good indicator of, of a family which is running smoothly. You know, there was once a professor, I got this from my, my, my tome of, of good advice from, from Reader's Digest. And this professor was giving a lecture on company slogans, and he's asked his servants, his students, if they were familiar with these, these, these slogans. Joey said, which company has the slogan, fly the friendly skies? Joey said, United. That was the correct airline. Brenda, can you tell which slogan has the, has the phrase, don't leave home without it? And she popped up with American Express. Now, John, tell me which company bears the slogan, just do it. That's easy, John said. That's my mom. Well, I think mom might have stolen, the shoe company might have stolen that from mom. I think everybody's mom's had a slogan that said, just do it. And if we asked why, because I said so. So Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a, what a remarkable promise. And I think Jesus is telling us that there's, a, there's an undeniable link between love and, and obedience. You, know, you, you can threaten a kid and, and make them be, be obedient. You can punish every act of, of de willful defiance. But the only way, and I think we know this, the only way our, our children are going to internalize the values that we want for them is that those values are, are connected by, by a remarkable bond of love that can't be broken. If that's true in our relationship with our children as parents, it sure is true in our relationship with God. Yeah. Jesus is telling us it's important to obey God's commandments. So, so let's begin there. Obey God's commands. You know, that sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? But I think it's a teaching which is by and large lost in, in, in 21st century world. We've become an incredibly permissive society, a, a do-your-own-thing society. That was a catchword not too long ago. The lines between right and wrong have been blurred in virtually every aspect of our society. You know, we make up our morality a morality as we go along, and uh, it's situational ethics on, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, people, a lot of folks who, who say they believe in God's commandments seem to have, seem to have an increasing difficulty in, in seeing how they apply to their own lives. And a lot of folks have a particularly hard time with obedience. There's an interesting book I came across a long time ago. It was written by a Tommy Nelson, and it's entitled uh, The Twelve Essentials of, a go of Godly Success. And he tells of his own experience of, of being a chaplain for a high school football team in Texas in the 1970s. You've got to believe that Tex in, in Texas, high school football is as close to a religion as you can find any place. And if you're a great high school football player or college football player in, in Texas, man, are you special. And Nelson says that, that on the team where he served the chaplain, there was a young man who was Probably the finest football, high school football player he, he'd ever seen. The young, young man was the only one of three athletes who were chosen as the Texas Athlete of the Year three times in a row. He was a three-time high school All-American. He was the number one pick, supposedly, in the draft for, by, by colleges. And when he was able to graduate, the, he had, had his choice of colleges. And he picked a school where, where the previous running back had, had come in second for the, the Heisman Trophy. And the question wasn't whether this, this young man was going to start or be a star. The question was, is he going to win the Heisman? And after the young man had made his decision, uh, Nelson went to his, this man's, young man's high school football coach and said, what do you think? you think he'll win the Heisman one day? The coach replied, he'll never even carry the ball in college. What do you mean? He said, this young fellow's got a, a serious character flaw that, that would eventually disqualify him. He said he knew the college coaches would see it right away, and that would be the end of his career. And the coach was right. The young fellow ended up attending four different colleges. He quit two and was kicked out of two. He finished without a degree. 
as coach predicted, he never made it as a college football player. We can think of, of local kids who have done remarkably well, outstanding. Number one picks in, 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 in high school football yet never really made it when, when they got to college. They, as long as this young man, had a serious character flaw. The character flaw the coach saw was this. He can't submit to authority. He can't submit to his parents. He can't submit to an employer. He can't submit to a teacher. He said, the coach told me we've carried him along through high school for the sake of the club. But I assure you, he will not submit to his college football coaches, and his career is done. This is as good as it's ever going to get for him. I know a lot of us are offended by the notion of obedience. We want to captain our, captain our own ship, but, but, but obedience is, is an important trait of, of a successful life, particularly when we think about obedience to God. Now, God is, is a God of abundant grace. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have some expectations for us. You know, we can read the scriptures and they are full of God's promises. But they're also full of God's instructions for the way we should live our lives. And obedience, particularly to those commands we find in the New Testament, are vitally important. I read some of the things online from uh, Chuck Swindle. And, and he uh, tells a wonderful modern day parable on, on this subject. He said, consider this. Imagine a company whose president decides it's time to travel abroad. He's going to be away for an extended period of time. So he, uh, he decides he's going to talk to his most trusted employees. And he says, look, look, I'm going away. I'm going to be away for a while. And while I'm away, I want you to pay, pay particular attention to, to the business. Take care of this business. You, know, you manage things while I'm away. And I'm going to write to you regularly. And when I do, I'll tell you what to do until I return. And everybody agrees that's a marvelous idea. And the president leaves and he's gone for a couple of years. That's amazing in itself. But he writes often with, with very detailed instructions as, as to what should be done and how his business should be conducted. And when he, when he finally returns, he, he's in for an incredible shock. Uh, as he approaches the, the front door of the company, he realizes that the flower beds, which were always meticulously planted, uh, are full of weeds. And one of the panels in the front door uh, has a broken piece of glass. And the receptionist is found at her, at her sleep at her front desk, and she's asleep. When he gets a look at the books, he says things are, are, are even worse. The business is racking up loss after loss after loss, and he says, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, look at this place. Didn't you get any of my letters? Oh, man, we got every single one of them. As a matter of fact, we, we had, a, had a letter study group for every Friday for, for the letters you sent to us. We even divided all the person up into small groups, and we discussed many of the really marvelous things you wrote. Some of those things were really kind of interesting. You'd be pleased that some of us have actually committed certain segments of those letters to memory. In fact, some people have memorized an entire letter or more. Great stuff in those letters. Okay. Okay, you, you got my letters. You studied them. You meditated on them. You discussed them. You memorized them. But what did you do about them? Do? We didn't do anything about them. You know, Christ, Christ left behind his followers. He left us behind. He had certain expectations that he wants us to meet. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. <coughs> you know, the same way the family really can't function without some measure of discipline, we, we can't serve Christ unless we serve some discipline over our spiritual lives. The thing he says, the thing he commands us to do are, are, are really <coughs> pretty simple. We know we've committed to the memory. He tells us we're, we're to love our neighbor. We're to keep the Ten Commandments. We're to help the poor. We are to welcome the stranger. We are to forgive those who wrong us, pray for those who insult us. <coughs> you know, just because we're saved by grace doesn't mean that there aren't instructions for us to follow about how we should live. They're really pretty simple. We are to obey God. We are to obey the instructions that, that Jesus gave us. 
And our obedience doesn't come out of fear. Our obedience comes out, out of our love for God. <clears throat> if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. You know, it's not kind of a blind obedience to some kind of heartless law. It's not a set of meaningless rituals that, that we have to adhere to. Lots of folks love rituals because that makes the world very simple for them. But Christ didn't want us to park our brains at the door. He didn't want us to be robots. He didn't want to be slaves to ritual. We're not clueless children. You know, this is a really a funny story. Again, this is a Reader's Digest story. Um, a library aide wrote to Reader's Digest some, a couple years ago about a trip of a, a, student, a group of students had made in her elementary school to, to see a symphony. And each class had been given detailed instructions as to what they were supposed to do. And one of the most important Instructions was they, they were to remain with their teacher at all times. And then the house lights went down, and one of the teachers got up and quietly uh, left her aisle seat and made her way to the ladies' room. As she placed her hand on the door, she, she heard a noise behind her, and she turned around, and her entire class, every one of them, obeying the instructions exactly, followed her to the restroom. So, the kids have been told... Follow me everywhere I go. Stay with me at all times. Well, you know, some folks are, are like kids. We're not kids. We don't live in blind obedience without exercising our brains. We're neither obedient out of fear of divine punishment. We seek to live according to Christ's teachings because, because we love him. He's our Savior. He's our Master. He's our Lord. We obey him because we love him. There's no, no really greater truth than that. Christ's teachings are given to us out of, out of God's love for us. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, Christ says to us. But what comes behind that is, is incredibly important. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. <clears throat> you know, isn't it appropriate to think about this on, on, on this very special day when we compare God's love to the love of a mother has for a child? You know, we knew that when Mom told us there was a rule to follow, even one as bland as don't sit too close to the TV or, or we put a jacket on or be in by midnight, you know, I think we, we knew in our heart that, that she did it out of love. You know, we were at the very center of her world, and, and she wanted us to be safe. She knew, as we find out, that, that it's a very dangerous world. There's some things that might bring us a few moments of happiness that might bring us heartache for a long, long period in our life. Now, Mom wasn't being mean. Maybe overly protective, but not mean. And moms are human. They make mistakes. But 99% of what they do, they do out of love. They really want our well-being. The only difference between God and a mother is that, that God doesn't make any mistakes. And God's love is limitless. He wants us all to live healthy and fulfilling lives. And so he gives us some instructions as to how we're to live our lives. And over time, when we obey, those instructions lead to a remarkably abundant life. God doesn't make mistakes. God's love is infinite. It never ends. God is there when, when we falter, when we try to follow those instructions and we make mistakes. But those commands come out of God's never-ending love for us. author, speaker, sports enthusiast, Pat Williams has a book uh, called A Lifetime of Success, and he gives what I think is one of the very best examples of, of a mother's love. He tells of a very, very special Atlanta Braves baseball game, the home opener in April 8, 1974. It was the night game, was against the Dodgers, and it was a complete sellout. He said, Williams looked around to see if there were any seats available, and uh, he said, so right behind me was Pearl Bailey. Up at the plate was the immortal Hank Aaron. On the line was Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs. But Aaron had tied that record, and tonight he was going to break it. At least he was the aim to break it. That was a record for, for more than 50 years, and, and an African-American player was, was about to topple the great Babe Ruth's home run record. And remarkably, there were a whole bunch of people in this country who, who didn't like that idea. If you can imagine, Aaron got 930,000 letters, far more than any other person in the country, 
But more than 100,000 of those letters were hate letters, death threat letters, both to Aaron and to his family. William says that he was on the edge of a seat when uh, Dodger pitcher Al Downing, used to be a Yankee by the way, hurled that ball toward home plate and Aaron swung and connected and the, the crack of the bat, everybody knew that the record was broken. The ball was gone. Home run. Hank Aaron now had the home run record. And the ballpark went nuts. As Aaron rounded second base and Williams, a couple of teenagers jumped over the retaining wall and ran onto the field and they were chasing Aaron. And for a moment, nobody knew what, what they had in mind. But it came clear that they were simply cheering and, and celebrating and cheering Aaron on. As he crossed home plate, the, the dugout emptied as the Braves streamed onto the field to surround him. They were cheering and whooping it up. Even Al Downing came in to help celebrate. But amid all those ball players around Aaron was, was a short, 68-year-old African-American woman. She latched onto Aaron and she would not let him go. Aaron turned to her and said, Mom, what in the world are you doing here? Baby, she said, they're going to get you. They've got to get me first. <coughs> That's the love only a mom could have for a child. They're going to get you, they're going to go through me first. It is, however, only a, a pale reflection of the love that God has for each and every one of us. Do you think that God would ever give us a command that wasn't for our, for our own good? If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen. May we confess our faith together. We believe in God, created our world and every living thing in it. Because all people in all places are God's children, we believe that they all have the right to be treated with dignity. We believe in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. We understand and believe that the power of his redeeming grace is available to all of us who seek it. And as recipients of that grace, we also believe we are called to live out and share the good news of the gospel. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to make all things new through God's grace and love. As we are forgiven, so must we forgive others. We believe in the triune God who continues to create, to wash us clean in the baptism of water, to inspire and empower us to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May bow our heads. God, with a mother's heart, you gather us as your children. You comfort and hold us in your warm embrace. When we hurt, your arms enfold us. When we are afraid, your wings protect us. When we are hungry, you feed us with the bread of life. God, with a mother's heart, you surround and support us in good times and in tough, in the midst of joy and pain, always and everywhere. You will never leave nor abandon us. <coughs> eternal God and loving God God with a mother's heart we thank you this day for being part of your family and may we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May your prayer, prayer of dedication be followed by the benediction and then our final hymn of worship. Gracious God, you have blessed us with so much. With grateful hearts, we offer not only the fruits of our financial resources, but ourselves as well. It is our fervent hope that you would use both the money and the talents you have blessed us with to bring light and word to those who need it most. Amen. And now may the risen Christ be with us as we seek to follow his example, forgiving and not hating, uplifting and not tearing down, serving instead of being served, and doing all things to the glory of God the Father. For in his precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>